Simpson. I'm a principal investigator at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research in Toronto. Uh, my research group develops um, algorithms for, for processing DNA sequencing data of the type that, that you've all heard about today, um, with a particular focus on uh, de novo genome assembly. Um, so this part of the course is going to be a little different than, than the previous sessions today in that this is only going to be a lecture. There's, there's no associated um, practical session. Um, but if you have any questions about choice of assemblers or, or how to run genome assemblers, feel free to ask either during the next hour um, after the course or, or email me. My, my email address is on the last slide here. Um, now, in this talk, I, I'm going to go through really genome assembly from both a technical level in what's happening under the hood in genome assemblers, how they're taking uh, a set of sequencing reads directly off, um, off a DNA sequencer and, and putting together that genome. Um, that'll be the first part of the talk. And, and the reason I go into the details of, of how the algorithms work for genome assembly is that it's still quite a difficult process to assemble a genome. And often when you'll take your own data, try to assemble it, you get results that aren't as good as you'd expect. Um, and really key to troubleshooting assemblies and understanding how it's gone wrong is this understanding of, of what's going on under the hood. Um, so the first part, I'll, I'll talk about that, exactly that, what's going on inside the genome assembler. I'll then walk through an example assembly pipeline of starting from the raw reads, going all the way to sets of contigs and scaffolds. Um, and then finally, I'll go through some examples of these problems that can come up. What are different features of a genome? What are characteristics of, of the data that might give you problems uh, when running a genome assembly? And hopefully this will allow you to have a better understanding when you go off a, and run assembly on your own. Um, so just to put us all on the same page, what is genome assembly? What do we mean when we talk about genome assembly? Well, it means just taking a genome, and here I'm just representing a genome as a set of colored bars. Um, where the genome's a mixture of unique sequences, which is this green, blue, um, light blue, and, and purple bar here, and repetitive elements. And the repetitive elements are these blocks of sequence that have been duplicated um, within that genome, and these repeats are what cause trouble for the genome assembler. There are sequences that look identical, and if your read length isn't long enough, you can't resolve where to place one repeat uh, versus another. So I'm just going to depict a genome like this, and I'll come back to this question of, of how it repeats affect uh, assemblers throughout the talk. Um, right, so we sequence a genome, and, and from the standpoint of the genome assembler, um, the sequencing reads are just an unordered sample of fragments of the genome. So you just randomly selected positions from the genome, put them into a bag, and then uh, the genome assembler has to reverse this process and put the genome back together, hopefully end-to-end, -end, um, into whatever that original source sequence was that you sampled with all these reads from. Right, so first I'll talk about assembly graphs, which are the, the data structures we use um, to work with sequencing reads. Then I'll talk about this example, ex example assembly pipeline. Then some of the features that make uh, genome assembly difficult. And finally, I'll end with um, talking about genome assembly with long reads, like you get from PAC bio sequencers, or like what you get from an Oxford nanopore sequencer, and how that makes the problem uh, a little bit easier um, due to the read length. Right, so key to understanding how genome assemblers work are, is understanding this concept of an assembly graph. Um, now, an assembly graph is used to represent the relationships between uh, the reads that you've sequenced. Um, so if two reads overlap, we might want to record the information that this pair of reads overlap. Um, and the genome assembler will use this to try to figure out what the correct sequence of the genome is. So I'll be coming back to this picture uh, a little bit later on. Um, but when we're working with these genome assembly graphs, uh, usually, a sequence read is a vertex in the graph, and if two sequence reads overlap, uh, they make an edge in this graph. Now, there's two types of graph that are used by uh, genome assembly software. There's what's called the Brown graph, which breaks all the reads into short fragments called kamers. Um, if you sequence a 100 base pair read, the assembler might break that read up into 61 base pair substrings, construct a graph of those substrings. I'll give an example of, just, of this in just a few minutes. 
And when we're building assemblies of luminant data, uh, most of the algorithms are based on this de Brown graph model. Uh, the reason being that it's extremely fast and efficient to work with these short fixed length substrings rather than um, complete reads and inexact overlaps between reads. Um, so the, the first type of graph is this de Brown graph, which is based on Kamers, and then the other type of graph is called a string graph, where we keep the reads intact, every read is a vertex in the graph, and if two reads overlap, we connect them with an edge. Um, so I'll give an example of this uh, overlapped-based graph now. So here we have a single read, which we'll call read 1, it's about 40 bases in length. We're going to add a vertex into the graph for that read. If we sequence another read, called a read 2, we'll add another vertex into this graph, and since the start of read 2 is the same sequence as the end of read 1, we connect them with an edge here. So this we're just going to progressively build up this assembly graph, so now we've got two vertices connected by an edge. If we sequence a third read, then um, it, the end of, uh, sorry, the beginning of read 3 matches the end of read 2, and it also matches the end of read 1. So we add this vertex into the graph, and we connect it to ed with edges to the two previous two vertices. Then if we sequence uh, a fourth read here, we're going to add another vertex to the graph and connect it with edges to all the reads that it overlaps. So just this, the, the, the beginning of some reads matches the end of another read, that's what we were talking about when we refer to overlaps between reads, just that a suffix of a read matches a prefix of another read. Now we've labeled all of the edges in this graph with the overhanging string between the reads. So when we connected this um, edge between read 2 and read 1, the overhanging part of read 2 is this string TAC. So we've uh, labeled the edge as this string TAC. Now what the genome assembly software is trying to do is it's going to try to find a path through this graph, which is just a sequence of vertices that are visited and concatenate all of these edge labels together, just joining them together into a string that spells the original sequence of the genome. So all the assembler is trying to do is build up this graph, which we call a string graph, and then find a path through it, and then the, the, the string that that path spells is the sequence of the genome. So that's really the, the high-level technical part of how, how genome assemblers are running. Now I'm going to use um, an example assembly pipeline to illustrate these concepts further. So this is what an assembly pipeline might look like. Your, the assembly software that you download from GitHub or somewhere on the internet, um, it will implement these steps um, and, and, and take the data from your raw FASTQ format all the way through to a FASTA file with consigs and scaffolds. Um, so the first thing we might do is um, some cleanup of the data to get rid of sequencing errors, sequencing artifacts by either trimming the reads or filtering them out. We'll then try to correct uh, sequencing errors in the read. We'll build one of these assembly, assembly graphs, clean up the graphs of additional artifacts, um, build contigs from the graph, scaffold them together, and finally try to fill in the gaps uh, in the scaffolds. And I'll go through all of these stages uh, individually. So the first one, and actually one of the more important stages, is just cleaning up your data before you give it to the assembler. Um, oftentimes, when you get an Illumina sequencing run, if, you, if there was some processing artifact, like you've concatenated uh, adapters onto the end of the sequence and the sequencer read into the adapter sequences, if you don't get rid of those adapters, they can look like very high copy repeats to the assembler. And what will happen is that the assembler will just stop at the position of, of wherever it finds these adapters. So this is an example run. So you guys all saw IGV uh, in, in the last module. This is an example of a sequencing run that had a lot of adapter contamination. And all of these colored bars here, these are soft clip reads. All of these colored bars are an adapter sequence. It was on the end of one of the reads. Now I tried to assemble this data and the assembly completely failed because of the fact that 40 to 50 percent of the reads had these sequencing adapters on them. If you then run uh, an adapter trimmer, I've listed some of them on this slide here, Kraken, Trimomatic, and Scythe, um, they will get rid of those adapters on the three prime end of the, uh, of the reads, present just genomic reads to the genome assembler and, and everything will work a lot better. Um, 
So this is an incredibly important step if you do have adaptive contamination. Another way that you might want to trim your reads is just if you have low quality bases at the end. So you might have seen an Illumina error profile, and I'll show it a little later, where the error rate increases at the three prime end of the read. Um, if that error rate, error rate increases quite drastically, you, you often want to trim the read back just in, uh, to get rid of those bad bases. That makes it a little easier on the assembler. Um, right, here's actually a slide with, with the error rate for six different sequencing runs. Um, so this is this was part of the assembly competition that I'll talk about a little bit later. We sequenced a yeast uh, fish, which was Lake Malawi cichlid, uh, boa constrictor, human genome, parakeet, and an oyster. Um, and this is the error rate as a function of the position in the read for these six different data sets. As you can see for this, uh, this parakeet bird data set, they sequence 150 base pair reads, and the error rate increased to about 3% at the three prime end of the read. This is a little bit higher than we're usually comfortable with, so you'd probably want to trim that back um, about, to about 100 bases just to get rid of those extra errors. Um, as an alternative to error, error trimming is we can perform error correction. Um, and this is where instead of just getting rid of all of that sequence that might be bad, we'll try to fix it to be what the true genomic sequence was at that position. Um, and how we do that is we use what's called Kamer based error correction. And to illustrate this, um, here's a, a single read where this position was miscalled. There was a sequencing error here where uh, the sequencer said there was a C. And how we're going to do this is we're going to exploit the redundancy in sequencing. Usually when you sequence a genome, you'll sequence it to 30 to 40x which means each base in the genome is covered 30 to 40 times um, per read. So if we have, um, if we take a substring of one of these reads and count how many times it was seen in other reads, um, the substrings that are true genomic sequence will be seen a lot. The things that are caused by sequencing errors, like this substring that contains a C, will be seen very few times. So what we want to do is we want to compare the number of times we see the genomic substrings to the number of times we see the, the substring of errors to identify where the sequencing errors occur. So an error correction algorithm will do exactly that. You will take um, every substring starting from the first and going to the last, and it'll count how many times that's seen. And we'll get a coverage profile that looks like this for the true genomic sequence, where it bounces between 20 to 30. And then when we hit a sequencing error, we see that the coverage drops to one. That's the, the algorithm will then say, okay, I think there's a sequencing error. It will then try to correct that error by just trying different substitutions at that position. And if it finds one that corrects the count profile up to this range of about 20 to 30 times, it would then make that, that fix and say it's corrected that C to a T or whatever the true base was. So this, this idea of Kamer-based error correction uh, has been quite popular, and there's a lot of software that implements this idea. Um, some genome assembly packages that you can download will have algorithms built in to do the error correction. Others, you can download uh, an external package that only does error correction. Uh, some of the most popular ones are listed here, like Quake, um, SGA is a software package I wrote, uh, Soap De Novo, BFC, Blet. Bless, Light, or Musket are all camera-based error correction uh, programs. An alternative way of doing error correction is finding overlaps between reads, like I showed before. So you find where the end of one read matches the, the beginning of another. If you find a lot of overlapping reads, you can then calculate a consensus sequence for the reads. Um, this works very well, and it can handle and it can handle different types of errors in camera-based correction, but it's typically too slow to run on very large genomes. So if you sequence a human genome, you might have a billion reads. Um, finding overlapping pairs uh, uh, out of the set of a billion reads takes a, a lot of compute time. So typically we use this, this faster Kamer-based error correction uh, for very large genomes. Right, so once we've cleaned up the data a little bit, um, we want to build the assembly graph. So one of the popular ways of doing this is building a brown graph, which I mentioned before. And again, this is built on the idea of uh, fixed length strings, which we call cameras. So here's an example of what a brown graph looks like um, for a camera size of four from these five different sequencing reads, which are length six. So what we're going to do 
is we would take every four basis substrate of these reads and we put it as a vertex in the graph. So the first four bases of this read, C, C, G, T, is a vertex here. Then the second one, C, G, T, T, is a vertex here. So we put all of the formers that are present in any one of these reads into the graph, and then we connect them by an edge if they're adjacent in a read. So we've connected C, C, G, T with C, G, T, T because they come next to each other in this read. When we build up the graph from all the reads, it looks like this. And we see that this substring, CGTT, is present twice in the reads, once followed by GTTA, once followed by GTTC. This causes a branch in the graph, and it's the assembler's job to try to figure out what the sequence of the genome is when accounting for this branch. So here, there's actually a unique solution. It can go from here to here, follow this branch around, down, back up to here, and then follow there. And that's a super string that spells every one of these reads in this, this little example. Now, a quick detour into the type of research that, that my group does. Um, so for a long time, I focused on trying to make genome assemblers very fast and memory efficient. Um, when we first got Illumina sequencing, um, in say around 2008, 2009, you could only sequence about 36 base pair reads. Um, when you try to sequence a human genome with that, you'd use a Kamer size of about 27. And if you tried to store one of these de Brown graphs I just showed you with 27 MERS for a human genome, um, it would take maybe a terabyte of memory. Now, typically people didn't have a terabyte of memory to use on genome assemblers. You might um, have to go to a supercomputing center where they'd have very large memory machines uh, to do your assembly. But since, this, since we've started working with Illumina data, um, we've developed new algorithms and new compressed representations of these graph-based data structures um, and have gotten that to, down to about 10 gigabytes of memory to do human genome assembly now. Um, so this is after about seven, eight years of, of fairly different al difficult algorithmic work um, that we've get, gotten to a point where we can do fairly routine genome assemblies um, for, for humans off of Illumina data. Um, if anybody's interested in, in the computer science of how this works and how we're able to do these uh, assemblies so efficiently, um, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Okay. Um, now, after we've constructed our graph, we're not quite ready to build contigs yet. Um, and what we want to do is a step called graph cleaning. And this is an additional data cleanup step where we try to get rid of different types of artifacts that appear in the assembly graph. So the first type of artifact is what we call tips. Um, and these artifacts are caused by uncorrected sequencing errors. Now, when I showed it the brown graph before, we had a vertex for every k-mer. Again, we're working with the same type of graph, but I'm just representing the k-mers as these uh, gray circles here. And when you get a sequencing error, you still put the k-mer for that position into the graph. But since errors tend to be rare and only occur, say, once or twice, what happens is that causes this spur off the graph where it has a couple of connected nodes that then ends up going nowhere. Again, we've got an error here that causes this spur, or what we call tip, and this error here causes this spur, what we call uh, tip as well. Um, so if your assembler is coming or along and it's trying to assemble the genome, it might get confused by these two alternative paths that go nowhere. So what the assembler wants to do is get rid of these erroneous branches um, that are just caused by sequencing errors. So that's one of the type of, of graph artifacts. The other is something that we call bubbles, which are caused by heterozygosity. Um, so if you sequence a, a diploid genome, you're, you're going to sample k-mers from either of the alleles cover, covering heterozygous sites. So here we have a CG heterozygote. And what happens is when you sample k-mers from those two alleles, it causes a, di a divergence in the graph where you can either follow a path for allele 1 at the top or allele 2 at the bottom. And this is a very distinctive structure um, where it's this divergence and then coming back together. So the assembler can actually efficiently identify these positions and, and say, okay, I think there's a heterozygous SNP here. Do you have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Why is the bubble uh, showing 4? I mean, there's only 
Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So, you'll, let's say we, we're working with a fairly short tamer. So, this tamer, TCGAT, is shared by both two alleles. So that would be here. Then if you slide it one base over, there's a camera CGATG and CGATC. So that's the first point of divergence, and that's this pair of nodes. If you slide it over again, we have GT, uh, GAT, GG, that's these two. And then it's just you keep sliding over so you have multiple um, nodes for that, that point. I think you're first. It'll be the exact size of your camera. It's the exact same. No, you don't. Um, you do get them. You, you, you don't expect them to actually occur. But if you have a sequencing error that, that's um, recurrent, it happens four or five times, that might give you enough coverage such that you don't get this tip structure, but rather it, it rejoins and you can have a, like an artificial bubble because of that. Um, also, if you have diverged copies of repeats, um, you'll get bubbles as well just because of paralogous uh, sequence variants. Okay, so after the, after the uh, assembler's built a graph, it might look like this. Um, and, and figuring out what the genome sequence is from this graph um, is probably fairly difficult. So the assembler is going to try to identify these tips and bubbles to make the graph simpler. So it'll start by finding all of the branches that are only connected on um, one end, it will then walk those back to see where they rejoin the graph and get rid of them. That simplifies the graph quite a bit. It will then try to find these divergences where the bubbles occur. It will walk to see when they rejoin uh, the graph and then collapse them down to just a single allele that will re be represented uh, in the final assembly. It will then um, try to build contigs, which typically is just trying to find the largest unbranching segments of the graph. So it'll compact all those nodes here. Then it sees there's a branch here that can't be resolved. It will compact all those nodes here, here, and so on. Until it's just merged, everything can be merged together without introducing any misassemblies. Now, how long are these contigs? Um, typically, for an Illumina uh, sequencing run of a bacterial genome, the contigs will be around 100,000 bases in length. If you sequence a large eukaryotic genome, like, say, a human genome, they might be uh, 10 to 20,000 bases in length. If you do pack bio sequencing, long read sequencing, um, you can get contig sizes in the mega bases, um, and that's something I'll return to a little later on. Now, finally, once we've got our contigs, um, if we've sequenced paired ends, we're not done yet, and we can build what are called scaffolds. And scaffolds are just a higher order structure where you try to link contigs together by paired ends that map between them, um, and you, you separate the contigs with a gap, which is just unknown sequence that you don't, um, that you can't figure out in between the contigs. And we call that higher order structure of linked contigs with gaps, uh, scaffolds. So the way we build scaffolds is that we map paired end reads to the contigs, and then we identify where a group of pairs maps to the end of one contig, and their mates maps to the and the different contigs. So I color code from here. So these blue pairs map here and then here. Then we have red here and here. It's, kind of, it's hard to see, but it's purple here and here, and then green here and here. So we would just link up those contigs by paired ends, and we build what we call a scaffold graph, which is really similar to these read graphs that I've been talking about before. Um, and, and we'd construct the scaffold from those. We can use the uh, paired end insert size distribution that we learned um, that we learned about in, in the previous modules to estimate how far apart these contigs are in the scaffolds um, and then you just fill in the sequence with ends representing the uncertainty uh, of that sequence between the contigs. Um, there's uh, a set of programs which are called gap fillers which will take those scaffolds and then try to do local assembly, which is um, not as strict, to try to fill in what the sequence is. Now, those gaps are caused usually by two things, either repetitive sequences that are too, uh, too difficult for the assembler to resolve, or just drops in coverage because you had either you didn't sequence your genome deeply enough, 
or perhaps there was some GC bias in that region that didn't allow it to be covered by, um, by reads. Um, if you have long reads to augment your short read assembly, there's programs that will let, allow you to use the long reads to fill in the gaps, um, which is especially helpful for highly repetitive regions. Okay, so I'm going to, is there, is there any questions about that part? Because I'm going to move into now, what are some of the difficulties for, for assemblers? Yeah. How uh, the assembler choose the seed sequence for a graph? Is that random? Um, so it, so it, will, it will select a k-mer size, and then every k-mer will become a vertex in the graph. And then when it's trying to do the compaction where it's finding the paths in the, in the graph, it will usually just pick a node at random. Uh, but it actually doesn't matter. It, it, no matter what node you pick, you'll arrive at the same set of contigs. And the second is, is there any sort of scoring? Like, you, have, you might have some graphs that resolve equally well. Uh, is there some sort of scoring that helps to resolve two, two possible paths that yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is some body of research on trying to find the genome assembly that maximizes the likelihood of the read data. So this is like a very principled framework for trying to find, you know, the best reconstruction of the genome. Those algorithms tend to be quite heavy because you're doing a lot of these calculations. You're looking at um, like a lot of different alternative paths, a lot of different alternative paths through the graph, and then pick whichever one's best. Um, you have to use hidden Markov models, things like that, to score the sequences. So they tend to only be used on very small genomes. Um, usually, when we're doing human genome size assemblies, we're, we're working so hard to get it to run quickly enough that we just do very simple things: take the contigs that are 10,000, 15,000 bases in length, and then, and then, and then that's the result. Right, so in 2013, there was um, an assembly competition which aimed to figure out what the best performing genome assemblers were. Um, genome assembly has been an incredibly popular research topic to work on. I worked on it for, for quite a few years. Many other uh, researchers have worked on it, and there's probably been 10, 15, maybe even 20 assembly software packages developed uh, in the last decade. So a big question was, what assemblers work best, um, what genomes do they work well on, and um, why do some genomes assemble very well, um, whereas others have problems. So this competition, which was called Assemblathon 2, uh, really aimed to, to address this question. Um, and there's a quote here from the lead author, Keith Bradnan, who, um, who really summarized what the field of assembly was in 2013 by saying, don't trust the results of a single assembly. If possible, generate several assemblies with different parameters and, uh, and different assembly software, and then select whatever the best one is um, for your purpose. I think this really underscores the state of the field in that there's a lot of uncertainty in genome assemblers. We're relatively happy with read mappers now where you can use BWA and it's going to give you a pretty good job. That's not quite the case with assemblers, and it's much more specific to the genome that you're trying to assemble. Um, now, on this slide, I'm just trying to summarize some of the factors that make a given assembly difficult. So I've touched on the idea of sequence repeats as being one of the key factors. Um, if there's high levels of heterozygosity, so if you're... Um, if you have these bubble structures occurring in multiple places in genome quite often, that can confuse the assembler. If your genome's not covered very well, that causes breaks in the contigs because you just don't have sequence reads there that, that allow you to, to, to link reads together. Um, if your sequencing is highly biased, if you sequence something that's either AT rich um, or GC rich, you might not cover the genome completely in reads, and that can cause problems with the assembler. Of course, if your reads have a lot of errors, or there's chimeric reads where you've joined up different places of the genome um, into a read, that causes problems with the graph. You mentioned sequencing adapters. If your samples are contaminated, or if you've sequenced multiple individuals rather than a single individual, uh, these are all factors that make it more difficult uh, for the assembler. Um, so 
what I wanted to do after this assemblathon paper was put together a package of tools that could measure all of these factors about how a given assembly might go wrong uh, automatically without any input from the users. So they could just take a FASTQ file, it will then measure if your coverage is good enough to do an assembly, how repetitive the genome is, how heterozygous, uh, heterozygous it is, as a way of giving the user information about how difficult that, that assembly is going to be. And the next few slides, I'm going I'm to explain how this program works and go over some examples of the reports that it generates, which is just a PDF file, which allowed you to explore the properties of the genome you're trying to sequence and choose an appropriate assembly strategy. Um, so I'm going to go back to this slide, which I showed at the very beginning. And essentially how the program works is it's going to analyze the structure of this assembly graph to estimate how difficult it is uh, going to be to assemble. So what we're going to do is we're try, going to try to identify how often these branches occur due to sequencing errors, how often branches occur due to heterozygous SNPs and indels, and repeats as well. And the way that we do this is we analyze how often these KMERs occur in the reads. So just like I was saying when we when we were talking about error correction, um, when you've sampled genomic KMERs, you usually see them 30 to 40 times if you if you've sequenced the uh, the genome quite deeply. And we can use that information to um, learn about the error rate and, and in particular the heterozygosity of uh, of the genome. So if we draw a histogram of the number of times a 51 mer, so just a fixed length string of 51 bases occurs, we get a, a plot that looks like this for a human genome. It peaks around uh, 28x, and that reflects the fact that we've sequenced the genome uh, fairly deeply. Now if we show the same histogram for a highly heterozygous genome, like the oyster genome, the histogram looks like this. And then what's happening here is that we have this bimodal distribution. And the reason for this is that the oyster genome has a SNP around 1 in 90 bases. So a lot of the KMERs are coming from, uh, are covering heterozygous SNPs and indels, and it's from this peak, and then another population of KMERs are from uh, just homozygous position that are uh, present on both chromosomes. And this sort of distribution causes a lot of problems for genome assembly. They want to treat the genome as being just a single string. They don't want to see a lot of these bubbles forming. So this oyster genome will definitely cause a lot of problems when you put it into a genome assembler just because of this high heterozygosity. And the level of heterozygosity is so high, it's readily apparent just looking at this count, this KMER count distribution. So now we can formalize this concept by just calculating how often these different types of uh, branches occur within the graph. Um, and in a paper I published in, in 2014, we have a statistical model for, for taking an arbitrary branch that's happened in the graph and classifying it into either a sequencing error, um, whether it came from a heterozygous SNP or indel, or whether it came from uh, a repeat. And this is just based on these coverage counts that I talked about. I'm not going to go into the math of how this works. But essentially what we get out is a prediction of how often um, there's heterozygosity within the genome. So this is these six genomes I showed before. Three of them were part of this assemblathon competition. And we see that the branch rate for the oyster genome is predicted to be about 1 in 100 bases. And this is just reflecting this high level of heterozygosity within the oyster genome. For the human genome, which is in the, this, uh, this color here, it's around 1 in 1,000 bases, which is also reflective of, of, of the diversity we expect when we sequence a human genome. Um, as a negative control, we sequence a haploid genome. We predicted about, um, I think, 1 in 30 to 1 in 40,000 uh, rate of heterozygosity in that. That's just these bubbles I was talking about that are caused by recurrent sequencing artifacts. So that gives us a lower bound on the sensitivity of predicting heterozygosity by analyzing this assembly graph. We can also do this for, for predicting the frequency of repeats. Um, again, for the oyster genome, we see a very high rate of repeats. For the human genome, we see a high rate of repeats as well. This is what we expect. We know the human genome is large and repetitive. And what we get from looking at these 
pictures is a measure of how difficult the graph is going to be to resolve for the assembly. So what you want when you sequence your genome and you put it onto one of these plots is for its branch rate to be down here, like this yeast genome, uh, which is relatively simple to assemble. Uh, this program will also predict the genome size for you. So here is just a prediction of genome size for these six test genomes. Human genome comes out to be about three gigabases, what we expect. Yeast genome is tiny down here at about 12 megabases. Um, the program will also assess the quality scores of your reads. So just plots the mean quality score by position. Just like when we looked at the error rate for these six data sets, you see that the bird data set has problems at the three prime end. Might need a bit of trimming there. Um, and we'll also predict the error rate as well for you. Uh, now the question of GC bias uh, came up a few times. I, I heard during the, the previous module and this program will also allow you to measure GC bias. So now we're looking at a 2D histogram of coverage versus GC constant. So coverage is on the y-axis, GC constant is on the x. So this is for the fish data set. And we see that it, there's no real, um, coverage is relatively <coughs> independent of GC in this case. This is what we want. We want to see most of the genome uh, covered uniformly, independent of what the GC content is. If we look at the yeast data, we start to see that there's this trend downwards in coverage uh, for higher GC. So by looking at these plots, you can start to see whether your, um, your sequencing coverage was biased for this run. Uh, again, we go back to this Oyster data set, which is very problematic, and we see that this, this has actually split just because of this high level of heterozygosity, whereas all of this density has come from heterozygous positions. This part of the density has come from homozygous position. And the program will also predict what the fragment size distribution is for your paired end reads, um, allowing you to check whether this met, uh, matches what you expect from um, your library prep. So here again, we have a variety of different data sets for the snake data, which is called constrictor. The insert size distribution was around 350, 360 bases. Uh, for the bird genome, it was around 500. And finally, the assembler will actually run a simulated assembly for you in, in just a few hours rather than having to wait multiple days to run the assembly um, to give you a measurement of how long it thinks your contigs will be as a function of this Kamer size for the de Brown graph. So we'll just sample paths through the graph, look to see how branching they are, and then tell you how long the contigs are. Now, the point I was trying to get at through these last 10 slides is that this yeast genome, which is very easy to assemble, you're going to get very long contigs no matter what camera size you pick. But for this oyster data set, which was extremely hard to assemble, you're always getting fairly short contigs. So this program can give you an answer in about six hours, total runtime, um, that gives you a measure of how difficult your assembly is going to be. Um, if your assembly then turns out to look very poor, you can go back through these other slides say, okay, maybe my coverage isn't so good, maybe the error rate's too high, maybe I have too many branches in this genome, um, and that helps you troubleshoot your assembly. Um, so here's the link to the code. I won't read this out since it's all on your printed out slides. Um, it really just takes three commands to run. You build an index from your FASTQ data. You then run this pre-QC program, which computes all these metrics, and then you run a program which prints out um, a PDF report for your genome. Okay, in just the last few minutes, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about long read assembly. So this has become a really prominent research direction probably the last four years um, since long read sequencing has become more available. So the PacBio guys really deserve a lot of credit for, um, for building this field as maybe five years ago, it was considered that the error rate within long sequencers was too high to do, to do genome assembly. So if you sequence with PacBio, the error rate will probably be between 15 and 20%. And as I said before, trying to find overlaps between um, reads is computationally difficult, and that is just compounded by high error rates. You have to search very hard to look for reads that have a true overlap um, when, they, when there's such a high error rate in the reads. But the engineers at PacBio, uh, mainly led by Jason Chin, 
Um, they developed very fast ways of calculating overlaps, and they developed ways of error correcting pack bio reads uh, such that they can get very high quality genome assemblies. Um, of course, the reads are much longer than Illumina reads. They're on, you can get 10,000 base reads on average uh, versus 100 base reads for Illumina. And this gives you, gives you a lot more information about um, how the, the repeat structures of genomes are compared to the short Illumina reads. Um, so as I said, PacBio really developed this field. More recently, Oxford Nanopore reads, which developed this, uh, Oxford Nanopore has developed this miniaturized USB-powered uh, DNA sequencer um, which has similar properties to PacBio reads are now, are now starting to be used for, for genome assembly as well. Now the assembly pipeline for long reads looks very similar to, to short reads with a few notable exceptions. Um, here, instead of doing uh, Kamer-based correction, we typically use overlap-based correction for long reads. Um, it tends to be computationally much more expensive. The reason we don't use Kamer-based error correction is that um, the error rate's too high to have perfect camers in your reads, they're usually interrupted by an error. Um, and so you'd need to use a very short camer if you want to use camer-based methods. And finally, the last step is typically um, polishing the consensus sequence. So when you take your, your long error-prone reads through the assembly pipeline, the final contigs that you get will often have quite a high error rate because there's so many errors in the reads. Um, so what we do is we do this step called polishing, where we use uh, fairly, statistic, uh, fairly sophisticated statistical models of how the sequencer works as a way of, of accurately correcting um, the, the final assembly and, and generating better consensus sequence. Um, this slide has just a few papers that are, are noteworthy to read if you're interested in long read assembly. Um, this paper in Nature Methods from three years ago uh, this is what I was talking about with PacBio. First demonstrated you can get complete E. coli genome assembled into a single contig using their sequencing data. Um, more recently, Adam Philippi's group has done great work on speeding up overlap uh, calculation for long reads. And they've, um, they have a paper on bioarchive, and I think it's now Nature Biotechnology uh, that you can read. And this is a paper from my group uh, just showing you can do complete genome assemblies of E. coli. Uh, using Oxford Nanopore data as well. Right, so final slide is just some recommendations for long read assemblers. Um, luckily, if you do have long reads, and I should caution that it is more expensive to obtain than short reads, but you tend to get much higher quality data. And one of the benefits of sequencing with long reads is that the pipelines are a lot more stable and they're a lot easier to run. Unlike Illumina, where you have this laundry list of problems that can happen when you sequence a genome, um, a lot of those problems go away when you have very long reads. So I can make a recommendation of just two pipelines uh, for long reads. So for PacBio, um, use Canoe to build contigs, followed by Quiver to polish the genome. Um, and for Oxford Nanopore data, use Canoe to build contigs, followed by Nanopolish uh, to build a consensus sequence. And as I've said, typically the results are, are far better than when you get short read assemblies. I think the best human genome assembly with Illumina data had contigs around 30 KB. For PacBio, they're around 20 megabases. So you just get much, much longer contigs that aren't really comparable. If you're doing serious genome assembly where you want to produce a reference genome for something that's very important, it's definitely worth it to pay for, pay for very long reads just because the quality assembly is so much higher. Right, so as I said, there's no tutorial, but you feel free to ask me questions and, and here now or, or just email me if anything else comes up. I haven't. Uh, that's a very good thing to bring up. Um, so, so the question is whether I've tried 10x genomics technology. So this is a new way of doing library prep where you can tag very long fragments of DNA, hundreds of KB, um, such that you know that all of the short reads came from the same 100 KB molecule um, through this library prep. And this gives you much longer range information than just mate pairs or, or any sort of paired ends. And it's becoming a very popular way of getting more information out of, out of short read sequencing. 
Um, so while I haven't done it, I, I know people are getting megabase size assemblies from using this sort of tagged information. So that, that's a good one to, to look into as well. Uh, I think it's cheaper than pack bio sequencing, but the drawback is you're still using basing it off short reads. So if you have very locally repetitive sequence, it, it, it'll struggle to assemble that, but you, you will have a lot of long range information. Yeah. Uh, in your program, When you do your assembly after, do you uh, choose your size based on that graph? Yeah, usually, so, so the traditional way of, of doing an assembly is you would just do a sweep over the cameras. You, you submit 50 jobs to your cluster okay. with different camera sizes, and then you'd pick whatever one gives you the longest context. Um, that takes a lot of time. If you're, doing a, if you're assembling a very large genome, you're going to spend just hours and hours doing that. Um, and exactly why I wrote this program is that you could just narrow it down. So rather than saying, you know, these cameras are always giving you fairly short values, you might not try them. You might just narrow it down to this range, which is giving you, giving, giving you the best assemblies. So while it's not going to predict exactly the optimal one, it should narrow the, 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 the choice down to, to a smaller range. Okay. And could you just re-explain the... N25, N50, N75, I know it's with like the, the length of your, your uh, Xeons, you add your contig yeah. length, and then, but I can never understand that. Yeah, so N50 is, is the length of the contig such that half of the genome is in that length or larger. Okay, so it, you can think of it like a weighted median of, of the, the distribution of contig length. Did you have one? Yeah. Yeah. If so, we usually shoot for when we do nanopore sequencing, eight KB. Um, for bacterial genome, that that works very well. At least in E. coli, the longest repeat is I think. Um, 6KB, which is ribosomal RNA. Now, if you could only sequence, say, 3,000 base pair reads, just because you don't have enough DNA, it would probably give you a better assembly than an Illumina assembly, but it wouldn't be as good as, as, as sequencing the 10K, 8, 8 to 10KB. So in theory, as long as you can cover the largest repeat genes, it should be... Yeah. Or at least the dominant repeat. Like for human genomes, ALU repeats, which are 400 bases, they cause a lot of the problems within the ascending graph. So you could get for pieces that are longer than that, you, you'd be in quite good shape. Um, if you want a complete genome, which even for, for human genomes isn't, isn't really feasible just because the centromeres are so repetitive, um, even you would, you'd max out to say megabase size contigs if you only had 3,000 bases. But yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a trade-off. One thing that a lot of people do is if, if you're sequencing something like, like say, Drosophila, where you can't, it's very small, you, you can't get a lot of DNA, they might pool multiple individuals to get to more DNA, but that's generally a bad idea because then you're sequencing a population, there's a lot more diversity, and it causes just all these branching structures in the graph. So as much as possible, you want to sequence isolated bits and then, and yeah. Yeah. Typically, um, you'd want to try PCR-free libraries. So that just so there's always going to be this bridge amplification PCR that happens on the flow cell. You can't get around that. But to make the library, you can remove the PCR step. Of course, this requires a lot of DNA. Um, if you're not doing the PCR, but that's that's the number one thing for getting rid of minimizing GC bias at least. Um, other than that, that's that, that's all you can do. Yeah. I, uh, I actually forgot the name of what this is, but I saw this thing where they were. Um, I like this. I just saw it online that they were talking about graph-based reference genomes mm -hmm. where there'd be multiple possibilities, and I'm sort of curious what the advantages of that were over just having like say this 
Yeah, so the interesting graph-based assemblies is um, mainly what, when, we, when we map a read to the reference genome. So we're just treating it as a linear sequence with no diversity. If, you, if, if that read came from something that's very different than the reference, it's not going to map very well. Say we came from some novel sequence, and there's a lot of novel sequence that's not present in the human reference. That's where it's going to go unmapped. If it has a very long insertion deletion uh, in it with respect to the reference, it might not map very well. So the idea is if we can build these reference graphs, which incorporate all that known polymorphism, it would map to one of the alternative branches better than just the linear sequence. So rather than losing that information, we'd be incorporating it directly within the reference. It's, that's really the cutting edge of, of algorithm design right now is graph-based reference genomes. It's not really in a state where people can use it, but it, it, it's an incredibly hot area of research. Yeah, I was just curious what the uses of that were. Yeah, it's, it's mainly just so we don't lose. We want to use as much information as we can when placing reads into the reference. Because right now everything is imperfect mapping, right? Because every time there's a variant, your read maps imperfectly. So once we have that type of representation, Mapping problem is easier. It's yeah. harder to actually represent all. Yeah, we're quite good at accounting for like just sequencing errors. You, when it's just single base edits, if it's larger edits, like insertions and deletions, if that information's in the graph, then it becomes, like Guillaume said, a much simpler problem. But there, I guess there's not that much tools that use these graph based yet. There's not yet, but there's it's growing. At least especially in the last year. There's there's a um, an organization called GA for GH. Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, and they're pushing forward the use of these graph-based algorithms. There's five or six groups who are all actively developing methods around this idea, and, and everybody expects that to be the next generation of mapping and variant calling tools. Cool. Uh, just a bit of uh, humor correction. So to me, that sounds like using consensus data before assembly. Is that just a, like, is that a computational trick to make assembly easier? Because the same data in the end will be used to generate a consensus, right? Yeah, it's a good question. Would, like uh, something we've we've worried about a lot is the size of these assembly graphs. If you have a, a human genome assembly graph, it can have ten billion vertices. That's quite a lot. It takes a long time to work with, a lot of memory. So if you correct the errors up front, it just shrinks the size of the graph down and makes it much more manageable to work with. So it's mainly a data reduction approach. So you um, more conservatively because you wouldn't want to generate those assembly errors. Yeah, like exactly. You, yeah. You, you typically be very conservative so you don't generate a lot of artifacts. You don't want to make, like, the, yeah. the overriding goal in assembly is, like, don't make errors yeah. because, you know, if you make an error in a reference genome, it goes into some database and then it's there forever. At least that's, that's how I've always designed my programs. Um, if, if the genome's fragmented because you're too conservative, you can then add in long reads later, fix it up, get longer contigs, but it's typically a lot harder to fix misassemblies. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was just wondering what some of these gaps from algorithms are based on if you're Yeah. So, so usually what you'll do, um, so when you when you pick your camera parameters, say here. You want to pick something that's high enough such that you're getting around a lot of repeats, but you don't want to pick a camera that's so high that, um, right, this isn't my computer. Um, you don't want to pick a camera that's so high that you're not covering the genome in, 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 in these cameras. You need much higher coverage if you're using a long camera side. I don't know if that was clear. Um, but. But because of the fact that there's this tension between using long cameras to resolve repeats and, and, and short cameras to have high coverage, if you pick a value that's too high, you just get coverage breaks. And what you can do is when you find that, that there's a gap, you can use a shorter camera to try to fill in that gap. Um, if the gap is caused by a repeat, you might use a longer camera. But it allows you to just adapt the parameters such that you can fill in that exact, uh, that exact sequence. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something my group works on quite a lot. Is that an alternative to using reference graphs is to just do everything in de novo assembly 
and then compare the assembled sequence to, to the reference genome afterwards, which tends to be easier. Um, the main problem with, with de novo assembly-based variant calling, which, so to give you a concrete example, we try to do, find somatic mutations, some mutations that are only occurring in a tumor, not in, a norm, in an individual's normal genome, um, by comparing the, the reads in, a, in an assembly graph. That works very well for long indels, which are a weakness for mapping-based approaches, but unless you have very high coverage, you might not see the variant. So the drawback of de novo assembly-based variant calling is that you just need much higher coverage and you have slightly lower power in repetitive regions because of these problems I talked about of having these branching structures in the graph. Is there any difference between your chemo structure and like chemo genie? Yeah, so this program, which, which will do a simulated assembly to let you pick KMERS, that's doing a very similar thing to KMER genie. So KMER genie is trying to predict the best K yeah. as well. Yeah. All right, if there's no more questions, as I said, my, my email's on the last slide here. Um, feel free to email me questions if, if you have any problems with your assemblies, happy to answer those.